Well, good morning again. Uh, great to be with you. I'm just so, uh, so privileged to introduce you once again to my dear brother, Leo Kobuna Akan. Let's give him a round of applause. Um, Leo uh, works for International Justice Mission. He's previously been the director of uh, mobilization for the um, IGEM office in Ghana. Uh, now, having completed his uh, degree at Fuller Seminary, which we got to hear him come up, he's now a graduate uh, with his uh, master's from Fuller Seminary and was hired uh, again by IJM, this time to mobilize uh, the North American uh, church. So he, he travels around to different churches and engages uh, communities, letting them know about the amazing work. I had the great privilege of working under Leo. He was my boss uh, for my years in Ghana. I felt like I spent about two years in the back of a taxi cab with him. Uh, and it's just uh, fantastic. He's responsible for keeping me alive uh, many, many times. Um, uh, I've uh, also just want to tell you, I've seen him uh, interact uh, with the highest level people in Ghana. The, he made friends with the, the president of Ghana, uh, the vice president of Ghana, and uh, their, uh, their spouses and enlisted their support. Uh, one time uh, we, were, we were hanging out in the vice president's house in his yard with the kids running around. It was incredible, the friends that you make, the, the chief justice of the Supreme Court of Ghana. And uh, the way Leo sometimes makes friends is, he, I remember him telling me, hey, we need friends in this one department, so we're just going to go there and knock on doors. <laughs> and we would just go, and he's like, well, what do we do? He's like, I don't know. We're just going to pray, and then we're going to knock on doors. And we go in, and he tried to bluff his way in to see the Secretary of State, you know, just like, hello, I'm here to see Joe, you know? <laughs> and he's like, if Joe won't see us, someone will, you know? Uh, it's incredible. So while he works at that level, I've also just seen him... Uh, be the same, the same man with uh, the humblest uh, child in a poor village on the shore of the lake, surrounded by fishing nets, and, and just uh, he is the, the same person uh, in, the, in the great halls of power or the humblest uh, reaches, uh, just being there to be an ambassador of Jesus Christ in all of those places. I, I've literally seen him just move, move mountains or God moving mountains uh, through him. Just absolutely a great honor to to have Leo come and bring the word. So thank you so much. Thank you, so much. Thank you very much, uh, Pastor Matt. Um, church, good morning. Good morning. And praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, it looks like some of us have forgotten. Okay, well, probably this is the first time you're worshiping with us. Um, so the first time I came here, I, I thought it's something very unique that we do very often in my whole country anytime we gather for worship, and that is, if I say praise the Lord, you can respond hallelujah. If I say hallelujah, you can respond praise the Lord. You remember that? So let's try it one more time. Church, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Church, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Church, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Church, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Wow, such a great gift to be with you all. Thank you so much for the privilege to be here. This is home for us as a family. Um, over the last two years, we've been coming here very often, and we've been blessed thoroughly by your hospitality um, any time we came into the space. Um, and so thank you all for being such amazing brothers and sisters and loving us so well. And so thank you all for all you do. And thank you to the Robins uh, for their continuous love and friendship. Um, for many years, counting now, and we've done so many things together. Uh, and the last time I remember seeing you, some of the things that really scared Matt a lot when he was in Ghana. But um, it was great, and I'm happy that I got him to eat with his fingers, you know, dip his fingers in soup and to eat with his fingers, uh, which was really new to him. So it was such a blessed time for me uh, to be able to spend time with Matt in Ghana. And a series of you around, and I, I had the privilege to just play a small part in when he was working on this project. Uh, and so uh, through that, I, I got transformed. I, I sincerely got transformed when I got the opportunity to be a part of uh, the work when he did in developing this Bible study material. And I got really transformed by that. And so as part of that transformation, that's what I'll be sharing with you. And let me say that that transformation was what inspired my wife and I to name our second son, the Kyles. Our second son is called the Kyles, and the Kyles means justice and righteousness. And it is as a result of this series. 
the Jazz Street Bible material, God impacted our lives so much. And when he blessed us with this boy, we got the nudge from him to call him Dikaio, so that every day continuously we will be reminded to lean into living a life of justice. So, such a great privilege to be here. If you don't mind, uh, please rise up on your feet and let's read the Word of God. Uh, please open your Bibles if it's on your phone. It's going to be on the screen, um, whichever way you want to read it, Matthew chapter 25, reading from verse 31 through to 46, Matthew 25, reading from 31 through to 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, uh, but the goat on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you walked on me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will, he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cast into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and you sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they will also will answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then, uh, then he will answer them saying, truly, I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Let me pray with us. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are. Thank you that you are the God of justice. And thank you that you have gathered us here in this space uh, to lean into that, and we pray that your spirit to continue to move. We pray that through your word, each and every one of us will experience you in a very unique way. May we encounter deep transformation through your word and through your Holy Spirit that is at work in this place. We thank you so much, and we pray all this in the only name that matters most, Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. Please, you may take your seats. So when uh, Pastor Matt started the series, he used the kente cloth um, as a metaphor uh, to really describe the fabric of uh, Scripture. And I remember he would always say that um, the long lines represent God, who is the major theme um, of the Bible, and the short lines are the various stories that are weaved in the Bible, and, and that's exactly what we are continuing in this series. And so if you are here for the first time, uh, the Kento fabric is a royal fabric uh, from Ghana, and I have mine here, and so the long threads are God himself in Scripture, God himself at work in Scripture, and the short threads uh, actually being the various stories, uh, which is in Scripture. But often uh, we know some of the various themes of Scripture, but the justice part is something that we rarely talk about. And I'm so grateful that as a church for the past seven weeks, we have been focusing on the theme of justice. Now, I remember sometime in 2018, uh, Matt and I would always 
travel to various parts of the country to engage with church leaders and uh, would go to some very remote areas uh, to mobilize pastors and church leaders and then have conversations on biblical justice. Uh, my home country is not so much familiar when it, when it comes to issues of biblical justice. And so we were so privileged to be, you know, visiting them and spending time with them in very remote villages with these hardworking pastors, passionate pastors, and engaging them on the theme of justice. And, and I remember at one particular point in time, we traveled uh, about seven hours towards a community called Ketakrachi. And whilst they were engaging uh, these local pastors about the problem of human trafficking and at the same time about the issue of uh, justice. And whilst we engaged them, one particular pastor who is um, very focused in doing outreach is going to very remote villages um, in this city, in this town, uh, to really preach the gospel, share with us, open us, open up and share with us that he literally has been seeing so many children being exploited. Because he was going into this community that was surrounded by the lake and would always see uh, children fishing on the lake. And so he would always see these children on the lake. And so when we engaged him, he was really moved and really wanted to do something about this problem. He said, I've seen children diving into the lake, children not going to school, wearing, uh, not wearing anything and just working under scorching hot sand. Uh, he said he, had actually, he actually saw children being beaten whilst working on the lake. And he himself openly said he had, he's had the opportunity to engage some of these children before and many of them had said to him that they were trafficked from other communities that were like 10 hours away from where they were and they were just being exploited on the lake. And so whilst we, convert, we had conversations, he said to us that he wants these children to be freed because he was specifically seeing how they were being exploited on the lake. And so fast forward, uh, this pastor was really motivated to help in the rescue of these children. Now, the story of these children that this pastor uh, had seen on the lake is not very different from uh, what we encounter in our city and what we encounter around the world. In our world today, there are many people around us in our community, uh, in this country and the world at large, who are experiencing many forms of exploitation. Um, in the world today, sadly, there are over 50 million brothers and sisters in the world today who are being exploited as slaves. 50 million brothers and sisters around the world are experiencing exploitation. Now, I was looking up the population of California, and the population of California is about 40 million. So, so just imagine the population of California and just add 10 million to it. That is exactly the number of people experiencing exploitation in our world today, specifically human trafficking. And so the reality of people experiencing danger and people experiencing marginalization is all around us. Uh, today in our world today, we have the problem of homelessness. We have the problem of refugees. We have the problem of uh, people who are sick. We have the problem of people who are grieving. We have the problem of people who can't take care of themselves because of their economic situation. That is the reality we find ourselves in. And it is it's also because we live in a broken world. So when God talks about the least of these, he's referring to those on the margins, those who are ill-equipped, those who are in vulnerable situations. These are the people that God refers to as the least of these. And the passage we read, uh, Jesus was really given a number of parables and it was nearing his time and he was just preparing his disciples for the end time. And here he talks about various parables and then narrows in about this parable about the judgment. And he says that you saw the naked, but you didn't clothe them. You saw uh, the sick, but you didn't visit them. 
But one thing I like about Jesus is the fact that Jesus himself, in describing the least of these, even before he came into the face of this earth, Jesus himself identified with the least of these. Jesus identified with the least of these. So Jesus Christ, during his time on earth, as fully God and man, identified with them. And don't forget that when he was born, there was no room in the inn, so he was laid in the manger wrapped in a swaddling cloth. And Jesus' father, Joseph, was a capital. Literally, he was a laborer, and they were among uh, the, those in the society that were considered not to have the economic capacity that others, other people had. Uh, Jesus, at one point in time, became an immigrant, and he became, uh, for the want of a better word, a refugee in Egypt because, because Herod was seeking to kill him. He and his family fled from Bethlehem to sojourn in Egypt in order to escape from Herod's destruction of male bones at that particular time. Herod felt threatened uh, by the birth of Jesus because he heard that he was going to be recognized as the king. And so Herod, in his attempt to protect his own power, decided to look for Jesus and to kill him. And also, Jesus was also from Nazareth. And Nazareth was considered a small town with not many economic activities. Uh, some theologians actually believe that people from Nazareth uh, were not among the political elite. Uh, they did not have much respect among other cultures. And so Nazareth was considered just a small place, and many people felt that nothing good was ever in Nazareth. And so that explains why you remember Nathaniel doubted when he heard that Jesus is from Nazareth. Nathaniel, in fact, questioned and quizzed, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And so Jesus Christ was also abused. He was attacked by those who felt he was making them unpopular. Or uh, uh, those who felt that he was going to topple their government. And you remember Judas collaborated with those with power to arrest him and to crucify him. Jesus was beaten. Jesus was mocked. He was treated like a thief. So Jesus Christ identified with the least of these. And he went through their experiences Jesus Christ went through their collective lived experiences because at one point he was a foreigner. He was an immigrant. At one point he was beaten. At one point he was mistreated. And at many points they sought to kill him and in fact they crucified him. So he identified with the least of these. And, and no wonder he told the people that what you did not do for them, you did not do for me. And what you did for them, you did for me. And so from the passage we just read, what are some things that I want us to go home? What are some things that God wants us to really consider as we embody the habit of living a life that really cares for the least of these? The first thing I want us to know is that they, those considered to be the least of these, they are not projects or objects. They are real humans with names and stories. And so those in our society, those in our community, those in our neighborhood who are considered to be the least of these, they are real humans. And sometimes the temptation is to treat them as projects. But that's not how Jesus saw them. That's not how Jesus engaged with them. And so if we seek to engage with those who would help affirm our ego, our aspirations, and the kind of social status we want, then we are not willing to engage with the least of these. And so the attitude of viewing ourselves more highly than the marginalized is often triggered by our own social construct of what we consider to be successful and significant. However, that is not how Jesus Christ wants us to engage with those experiencing exploitation and other forms of violence around us. 
those in situations of exploitations and vulnerability are like us. They bear the image of God and he loves them radically and so must we. Our brothers and sisters who are currently being exploited on the water lake right now are just like you. They are just like me standing here. The Volta Lake, arguably, is among the largest mammal lake in the world, and children as young as four years old have been taken away from their parents, and they are being exploited in this fishing industry on the Volta Lake. And these children could be your son, they could be your daughter, they could be your niece, they could be your nephew. Friends, if you don't mind, I want you to take a moment, just taking a deep breath. Would you mind breathing in deeply and breathing out? And then please close your eyes for a moment. And just imagine yourself being a six-year-old boy and you're made to work for six hours a day under a scorching hot sun with so much humidity and you're being asked to paddle and build water out of this leaky, leaky canoe board. Just imagine yourself being denied your childhood experiences as an eight-year-old girl. Or just imagine yourself being beaten by a paddle at the deep end of the lake when you and even when you complain in those situations, you're just told to keep quiet. And just imagine not knowing how to swim and seeing another child drown on the lake. Friends, you can open your eyes now. Now, this is the dark reality of the problem of child slavery on Lake Volta. And this dark reality is similar and very the same as what other people who are considered to be the least of these experience around the world today. But Jesus Christ is the father of these people. Jesus Christ loves these people so much. And that's why in Psalm 68, uh, reading from verse 4 to 5, the Bible says, sing to God, sing praises to his name, lift up a song to him who rides through the desert. His name is the Lord, exalt before him. Verse 5, father of the fatherless and protector of widows is God in his holy habitation. Our God cares so much about these people. Our God loves these brothers and sisters. And so in our passage, the participants clearly ask Jesus, when did we see you hungry, thirsty, or as a stranger? In effect, Jesus was saying that I am for them and I am standing with them as their father. When we see, hear, and empathize with those in pain, we are standing on the side of God. The second thing we can see from this passage is that interruptions from the least of these are opportunities to serve and grow. Interruptions from the least of these or those considered to be on the margins, or those who are struggling, those who are in pain, those who have been exploited, when we get interrupted by them, those moments are often opportunities for us to serve and grow. And I, I come from a culture that is very communal. And when I came into the U.S. culture, I had to really learn a lot. I, I came into a culture where I had to learn that Everything in this culture is really scheduled and timed. Like, there's no room for interruption. Like, everything is really scheduled. You know, you need to have everything planned out and scheduled out. Like, everything is timed. 
And, and that's why I, I'm, I'm excited that today I'm going to interrupt your schedule because I'm going to be preaching for the next one hour. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, so our culture today is fixated on schedules and we have everything timed out. We, we hardly make room for interruptions. I'm sure for some of us gathered here, we are already looking out to go out, to go do the other thing that we already have scheduled for, 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 for today and, and the things that we have already, you know, planned out. We have our schedules really intact. However, from the passage, we can see that many of the encounters that the people had with the least of these came as interruptions. And, and please don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that scheduling your time is bad. No, it's good to have your schedules planned out. But all I'm trying to say is that be willing and be open to interruptions. And so, not that these people were intentional about looking for people on the margins to serve, but they encountered these people when they were engaged in their daily routines. And uh, for all of us, we also get to see and experience that. For each of us, amid our carefully planned routines, we get to hear or encounter people who are experiencing pain. And we get to have the choice to either allow ourselves to be interrupted and save these people or to avoid them because attending to them would mess up our schedule and our comfort. Uh, this is similar to the parable of the Samaritan that Jesus gave in John chapter 10. The priests and the Levites uh, were too busy with their schedule that they did not want their schedules to be interrupted. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ himself allowed himself to be interrupted by the least of these. Maybe a majority of his miracles were interruptions. Uh, from 10 what time to 1, remember the wedding in John chapter 3? <laughs> Even when the man approached, he said, no, don't do this. My time hasn't come. Those were interruptions. So from 10 what time to 1, get confronted by demonized people to someone cutting a hole in the roof. You remember that story? Someone cutting a hole in the roof to bring the sick person to Jesus because Jesus was speaking in that room. In fact, some scholars, some theologians actually believe that that could have been Jesus' house. That could have been a place where Jesus was living at that time. And so talk about nutrition. If someone cut a hole in my roof, I don't think I would react like the way Jesus reacted. I'm not sure you'd have reacted the way Jesus reacted. And I'd have, ah! What's happening? Huh. And so an interruption of any form that comes away, many a time comes with sometimes some meaningful things that the Lord wants to do. And, and I think I would have just secured if I were Jesus when Jairus interrupted Jesus and talking about his daughter. But Jesus is frustratingly slow and he is always open to interruptions. And so from the little, little children that came to Jesus to unclean people that came to Jesus and to desperate people who needed his mercy and his healing. Now, to the times where people came to Jesus and asked Jesus, Jesus, should we pay taxes? What should we do with this woman who has been caught in adultery? And so brothers and sisters, if our father in heaven is ready for interruptions from the sick, enslaved, abused, and the outcast. Are we? Are we? Are we? That your boy, if I like that your boy, if so much because he experienced so many interruptions. The Nazis government really attacked him several times. And he says this about interruptions. He says that we must be ready to allow ourselves to be interrupted by God who thwart our plans and frustrates our ways time and again, even daily by sending people across our path with their demands and requests. We can then pass them by, preoccupied with our important daily tasks, just as the priest, perhaps reading the Bible, 
passed by the man who had fallen among, among robbers. When we do that, we pass by the visible sign of the cross raised in our lives to show us that God's way and not our own is what counts. And so for me personally, the paradigm shift for me is that I am trying to believe, the paradigm shift I'm trying to believe is that interruptions are longer intrusions. And interruption becomes an opportunity when we ask God, what are you up to? And what do you want to teach me or show me? And brothers and sisters, I'm not saying that we should not have healthy boundaries. We must have healthy boundaries because not all interruptions are from God. And so it's important for us to have healthy boundaries. For instance, if my son is in an emergency situation, seriously sick, and an interruption comes, I wouldn't just abandon my son and then move on the other end. And so we need to have healthy boundaries as interruptions do come on our way and discern how God wants us to lean into those interruptions. So church, are you ready for interruptions? Are we ready for interruptions? Are we ready for interruptions? Your yes is a bit mad. Are we ready for interruptions? Okay, thank you. Two hours more to go before our service ends. Now, brothers and sisters, let me go back to the story of the evangelist, of the pastor I started with in Ghana. After interactions with the pastor about, you know, working with him to help rescue these children, this pastor decided to meet with the police and together with our team, he provided details of where these children could be located. Now, our team, together with the police, planned a rescue um, action with the pastor. And they decided that they were going to help rescue these children. And so, a date was scheduled. And when the date came, the date that was scheduled, our team called the pastor so that they could go to this rural community and help rescue these children. They called the pastor severally. The pastor's phone was off. Our team waited and waited to try several means to get a hold of the pastor. In fact, they reached out to Martin High and said, Martin, we are trying to get the pastor. He's nowhere to be found. And Martin and I were like, oh God, what's happening? Apparently, the pastor was scared for his life. He couldn't gather enough courage to go lead the team to rescue these children. He was really scared for his life. But thankfully, whilst the team was just in the field and figuring out what to do, a call came through about a young boy by name Godwin who had called and said, I am being exploited. Could you help bring me rescue? And the team right there, they had already gathered all the resources that they need because they were there to rescue children. And they had experienced a disappointment from the pastor. But unknown to them, God had already brought another form of rescue situation. And they put together their equipment and everything and went to the field and went there and rescued Godwin. Now, when Godwin got rescued and was brought to safety, Godwin said, no! That's not the end of the story. There are other children, some of my friends who are still being exploited. Go get them. And what Godwin did was to provide specific names and details and locations of where these other children were hidden. And Godwin courageously led the team of police to these other children, and these other children were rescued. And when these other children were rescued, when they came back, a young girl was among them by name Esther. And Esther still said, no, my friends are still there. Could you go get my friends? And Esther provided names and details and locations. And the police went back that same week and got Esther's friend. And through Godwin and Esther's heroic action, 29 brothers and sisters were rescued in that mission. Brothers and sisters, that's how God invites us to be a part of his mission of caring for the least of these. And the third point I would like to share with us is loving the least of these is an expression of our worship. Friends, 
as you already know, I am from Ghana. I came from Ghana. I was born in Ghana. And in fact, my family originally is from um, a town called Elmina. Elmina used to be one of the source communities for during the transatlantic slave trade. And so uh, brothers and sisters that were trafficked from other parts of West Africa will be brought to Elmina as the place and then they'll be shipped out of Ghana. And so including my ancestors, they were trafficked in Elmina and they'll be shipped to other parts of the world. And within uh, the Elmina, that's where the slave castle is located. One of the slave castles called Elmina Slave Castle. Now, when they built this slave castle, they had in there a chapel as well. And I'm sure Pastor Man has shown you this already. But you can see this is a slave castle. It's a huge slave castle. And it's still seated right by the shores of the Elmina castle, as you can see. Now, the next image you see there is that right in the middle of this castle, there is this chapel on top of a dungeon. And anytime I go to this place, I tend to weep. Because these slave masters were claiming to worship Almighty God on top of a dungeon where they held slaves. And as I think about this, I look at my own life and I remind and I remember my own life about how when I gave my life to Jesus, I didn't care much about the poor. That when I gave my life to Jesus, I didn't care much about the least of these. That when I gave my life to Jesus, I didn't care much about those who are being exploited. That when I gave my life to Jesus, as a Christian, I didn't care about the least of these. I was like the slave masters that were worshiping God in the chapel while those that they were exploiting were kept in the dungeon. Perhaps that could be your story as well. That you are seated right here, but you do not care and love for the least of these. Probably that's your story. If that's your story, then we are just like those slave masters that were worshiping God and never cared for those that were being exploited. And so, brothers and sisters, the way we view, interact, and treat those on the margins is a reflection of who and what we worship. The way we care for the least of these is a reflection of who and what we worship. And so Jesus Christ told the folks on the right these words. He told them, because you did it for the stranger, you did it for me. Because you did it for the naked, you did it for me. Because you did it for the homeless, you did it for me. Because you did it for the traffic child, you did it for me. Brothers and sisters, the truth is that if we were to find ourselves in the situation that these brothers and sisters are in, we would want people to see us. We would want people to hear us. And we would want people to create the space for us to experience freedom, hope, and justice. And that's why I like how Gary Hagen describes this. He says that justice is doing for others what we would want done for us. So today, consider how you would realign your heart towards the least of these in your neighborhood, in your city and the world at large. Friends, as I bring this session to a close, I want to invite you to take a number of actions. Now, if you want to lean into caring and loving the least of these, it begins by first and foremost, knowing the one that has called you to love them. If you don't know Jesus, then you cannot love the least of these in the manner he wants you to love them. And so if you're here this morning and you do not have a relationship with Jesus, or you're thinking and trying to figure out what it means to follow Jesus, I want to encourage you to talk to one of the pastors or the elders of the church. That is where the journey begins. The journey of loving the least of these begins 
by following the one who created them and us. The second thing I want you to consider is that I'm sure that the Lord is nudging something new in your heart. And there are probably areas or moments in your own life where you've not loved the least of these the way God wants you to love them. Would you take a moment and ask God for mercy? That there's been moments in my life that I haven't loved them the way God wants me to love them. Just take a moment and just ask God for mercy and ask God for forgiveness. Also, would you take a moment to pray and ask God to help you to discern ways he wants you to be a part of his redemptive work for those experiencing exploitation or those who are among the least of these. Ask God to help you to discern how you can love them, how you can support them how you can be a part of the story God is writing about them. And friends, finally today, I want to invite you to consider partnering with IGM to help address the problem of human trafficking around the world. Like I shared, like I, like I shared earlier, there are 50 million plus brothers and sisters who are being exploited right now as we have gathered in this sanctuary. And for some of us, all of us can be on the front line, but we can become that medium through which God would use to bring freedom and restoration to these brothers and sisters. Now, this is a QR code if you want to uh, partner with IGM, if you want to become a financial partner where you would say that, I, I want to support the restoration, the rescue, and the strengthening of justice system around the world by partnering with IGM Financial with this amount monthly. I want to encourage you to scan the QR code up there on the screen, and I need to take you through the process. Or we have a, a table right behind there uh, where my, my amazing colleague, Anthony, is right there to interact with you. I'm going to be there as well. If you want to learn more, we are happy to interact with you for you to learn more about the ministry of IGM. And I want to encourage you to consider partnering with IGM as we help in bringing uh, rescue and freedom to brothers and sisters trafficked around the world. So you can scan the QR code, it will take you there, or you can come to a booth right behind there, and we will be happy to chat you through that, and you can sign up at the booth as well. Shall we pray? Thank you, Jesus, for the assignment, and thank you that you are at work bringing redemption, bringing freedom, bringing hope to the least of these. Thank you that you have invited us to be a part of your work of restoring these brothers and sisters of ours. And we pray that you will give us the grace to be faithful to that calling. And we pray that, Lord, your kingdom will come in places of darkness. Let there be hope. Let there be freedom in any part of this world where there is exploitation, where there is abuse of God. We pray that your kingdom will come in the city of Milpitas. Your kingdom will come in the state of California. Your kingdom will come in this country. Your kingdom will come in Ghana. Your kingdom will come in the Philippines. Your kingdom will come in Indonesia. Your kingdom will come in China. Your kingdom will come in South Korea. Your kingdom will come in India. Your kingdom will come in Cambodia, in Colombia, in Bolivia, in Peru, in every part of this world. Let your life of freedom shine forth in all those dark places. Let your light of hope beam in these dark places that even if there's anybody plotting and planning to traffic anybody right now, Lord, convict them. And we pray the Lord you would give these survivors hope knowing that, oh God, you are at work to bring them redemption. We ask all this in the only name that matters most, Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. And everybody shall shout a big amen. amen. Church, 
Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Awesome. Fantastic. Hey, thank you so much for being here with us today. If anyone would like prayer, we're going to have a prayer team right over here, and you can go to them and just ask them, tell them anything on your mind, and they will uh, pray for you. We'd love to have you come to the Sarah Groves concert. Uh, to guarantee you have a ticket, I really recommend that you buy it. You can use this QR code. Uh, or you can, uh, Sue McKinney's going to be out in the lobby, and you can go there to that table and, uh, and buy it directly uh, from her to guarantee that you'll have a seat. Uh, we'll sell tickets at the door only until we reach that cap. So again, we'd love to have you come to that amazing concert. It's just a really rare opportunity to have such a, a prominent artist come and uh, sing with us. Um, we also want to really want to encourage you both either today or at the concert to visit the iJam table, which is also going to be in the table. Uh, Pastor Leo will, uh, will be out there along with his uh, Bay Area uh, colleague um, uh, representing that. And what you can do there is become a freedom partner. It's similar to like uh, sponsoring a child through compassion, only this is sponsoring the whole uh, work um, to rescue a trafficked uh, child. And you can uh, pledge there. And, and, and what you do when you support IJM in that way is you're funding undercover investigators to go and find the children. You're, you're, you're um, hiring uh, aftercare social workers to trace and, and, and do long search for their families. Uh, you're, you're hiring uh, lawyers that work with uh, Gu Ghanaian uh, government prosecutors to put the, the perpetrators in jail to protect future victims. Uh, you're funding homes where kids can go and, and, and have a new life and receive education and a hope uh, for their future. And you're funding people like Leo that are mobilizing the community uh, there um, at, at, at um, field offices around the world. It's just an incredible ministry. So we encourage you to uh, consider uh, becoming a freedom partner uh, as well. We always appreciate uh, your gifts to the church as well, which fund our ministry and mission, uh, your volunteering, uh, your time and energy as well. We're so uh, grateful for you. So now in place of a traditional benediction, uh, I've asked Leo to lead us in a justice pledge. You saw a video of him doing this. You remember this video of him doing this? Uh, he's done this at the, the shores of Volta Lake with pastors from Ketakrachi and Yeji. And we asked him, would he please lead us in that as well? So... Are you ready? Yes. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, so it's going to be up there. So one thing I want you to know that the work of justice and the work of love and the least of these ultimately rests with our God. He is the one that brings transformation. So we are going to take this justice uh, pledge knowing that it is our God who is at work. And we have the privilege to join him. So I want us to say this, say this after me, say, true God, true God. I, commit I commit to embodying justice, to embody justice. Until, all until all are free. Let's take it one more time. True God, true God. I, commit to I commit to embodying justice, justice. until all are free. Let's do one more time with our hands up if you can. Until all are free. Until all are free. Let's do it for the last time. Until all are free. Until all, all are free. free. Thank you. May the Lord bless us and keep us. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all.